Welcome everyone to this, the final uh, session of day one uh, called uh, Innovation to What Purpose? Uh, and it's, it's actually a great privilege to welcome uh, John Ralston Saul among us uh, to speak to this team. And rather than give you what I call the technical biography, uh, let me suggest to you that there, that there are four uh, themes that come out of John's career work and activity that are of pertinence to a group such as ours. Um, the first is, is, is the power of observation and of understanding. And, and John began his, his career as, as, uh, as someone involved in Canadian public policy. In fact, he was uh, one of those that created our national energy company in, in the 1970s. And then chose to travel the world with uh, rebel armies. And in the process, uh, got a deep appreciation, I guess, of the importance of um, freedom uh, and the tragedy of repression and the importance of ideas and the ability to express them as freely as we can. And that's something that has stayed with him and his work throughout. In fact, in 2009, he was elected president of Penn International, the wonderful organization devoted to freedom of expression, particularly among writers in, in difficult situations. And so that's one thought. The other, and, and Canadians would recognize this, he has been instrumental in helping us understand our country. And he is a historian, essayist, and, and, and uh, analyst of Canadian history and the institutions that have made this country what it is. And I think that's, that's important when we talk about concepts like social capital. Uh, third, um, and, and this uh, goes to his, his uh, considerable and prodigious uh, writing. Uh, the work that began with the Field Trilogy and then continued, which has a deep appreciation um, of individualism, dictatorship, the importance of values, uh, sometimes the tragedy of ideology. And in fact, he's given us the phrase, the dictatorship of reason which in one way or another informs, I think, a lot of the work that INET and CG do. Um, and finally, uh, I, I should mention his work and his essay in 2004, maybe it was 2005, The Collapse of Globalism, which has since been reissued in many forms in which uh, he made some very pertinent observations about both globalization but also the fracturing of societies that glo globalization brings and in the process, in fact, predicted much of what we're now seeing and experiencing. So with that short introduction, let me uh, ask John to join us on stage, uh, and please welcome him. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. I think this is uh, a remarkable organization, these two organizations, and this putting together the two organizations. I think there are so few places where people are actually eager to uh, be overcome by doubt in the good sense um, and to uh, hear questions being asked and to hear debates taking place. Uh, this is a, a very valuable uh, idea holding this conference. It's very unlike other conferences. And uh, Jim Balsilli is here, and I, I think we owe a lot of thanks to him for this. And, um, and George Soros, who isn't, we also owe a lot of thanks to you for taking this, uh, this initiative. Uh, let me, I'm going to do some, some, some very straightforward things tonight. Um, so let me just begin with the story, which I usually wouldn't do, but uh, since that's what they tell you you're supposed to do, um, which is, of course, the old Robert Owen story, New Lanark, the early days of the Industrial Revolution. A gigantic step in innovation has been taking place and is taking place. And, you know, people always think that their, their era of innovation is the most important one. But I mean, it really depends on where you're standing. It could easily be argued that 
the era of uh, the first Industrial Revolution was a more important change than the current changes in communication. You make the argument, it doesn't really matter which is true. Anyway, uh, as you know, most of you I'm sure know, uh, the economists certainly do, um, Robert Owen was a, one of a bunch of guys who were taking advantage of innovation, of technological innovation, and uh, in, a, in many ways fathers of what we would call capitalism, and they set up these factories, and they were very rough and ready. It was a man's world. It, in a sense, they were almost expressing that idea of the, the wild man who could do anything, even though that actually meant the suffering of children and women and people dying in machines and all the rest of it. Um, and it was all in the name of this new thing, capitalism. And Robert Owen, uh, looked around and thought this was unacceptable and uh, started to uh, reform his factories. I'm doing no justice to exactitude in the way I'm telling the story. Um, and, uh, you know, said he wouldn't hire, I think, girls under a certain age and that he would have schools and that he would have dance lessons and that he would have safer and cleaner places. And the most, fa two fascinating things happened, which is rarely talked about. The first is that um, he made more money than the barbarians. He, he invested, he, he made choices about the shaping of innovation. Said it is not inevitable that you must let you know, technology do what it has to do. You can shape it. You can make it better for society and for people. And he made more money than they did. The second fascinating thing when you go back and look is they hated him. They absolutely hated him for making more money than they did by doing it in a more civilized way. Because in some way it was an insult to their masculinity or something. I'm not quite sure what. And they didn't reform themselves in order to make more money. Because they believed somehow in their heart of hearts that it was their right to act badly even if it meant making less money. And this is a very important story because it tells you a great deal about the, the possible meanings of capitalism let run wild and the possible meanings of capitalism with proper interventions by civilization in order to make it civilized, in order to allow it to be stable and profitable. It's a very interesting and profound story. We've been dealing with this story again over the last 40 years, as if it had never happened before. We've been going back over the same bloody story as if it were true that you made more money and societies were more successful if you didn't make things stable and you didn't shape technology. We have hundreds of years of experience that tells us it is not true. So um, who is more contemptible than he who scorns knowledge of himself? John of Salisbury, 1159. Um, I choose him as an opener rather than Socrates because I know that uh, uh, Professor Sandel is going to speak tomorrow and I should leave, uh, should leave Socrates to you. But, but, uh, but, you know, it is the unexamined life is not worth living. Uh, and really what Robert Owen was saying, and later on he went a bit crazy, but what he was really saying is the examined life is worth living. And it is contemptible to scorn knowledge of yourself. So what, what they're saying and what I'm saying and what other people say is that the examined life, knowledge of yourself, is consciousness. Uh, it's not self-indulgent consciousness. It's not Woody Allen consciousness. Who knows? <laughs> it's consciousness. And it's not, not only not tied to self-indulgence, it has always been in the Western tradition, but frankly also in the Confucian tradition, in the Buddhist tradition, in the Islamic tradition, it has always been tied to empathy. You become conscious by your capacity to imagine the other. That, you know, there's a lot of philosophy taught out there around the world, but it can all be boiled down to consciousness, imagining the other, the unexamined life is not worth living. It would put a lot of philosophy professors out of business, but it, it can be boiled down. That's where it begins. And there is agreement around the world on that meaning of how you get consciousness, how, you, how consciousness can function at a societal level and at an individual level over 
an extended period of time. Civilization is an extended period of time. Empathy. You imagine yourself by being able to imagine the other. Barbarism, the opposite of civilization. Barbarism is a society of unconscious, willful, childlike people indulging themselves. People, for example, who believe that self-interest comes first. Now, this is a room filled with people who have self-interest, which includes me. I mean, an author who doesn't have self-interest is going to starve, to put it bluntly. We all have self-interest, but it, none of us, I think, in this room believe that that is the element which leads society. It exists, but it has never shown itself capable of driving a civilization, which is the Robert Owen, Salisbury, Socrat Socratic uh, message. Every serious philosophy is clear about this. History demonstrates this repeatedly. And civilization, as Socrates, Vico, Erasmus, and Adam Smith pointed out, is based on empathy through consciousness. A small detail as I go by, and I don't know, Professor Stiglitz, what you would, you would, you would, you would you'd know better than me. Um, I am appalled by the fact that economics departments are filled with people who don't read Adam Smith. They read extracts from Adam Smith. They read the comic book highlights, which suit their ideology. And in the business schools, they only read probably two highlights that are only one line long each. And I can only think of one of them now, which you know. And let's say there is another one to be nice to them. Uh, so they don't actually know the relationship between Adam Smith and humanism and empathy. They simply don't know it. And they don't know that that was the basis of all of his arguments. So consciousness and empathy are all about the possibility, next step. This is tough doing this after you've eaten, so you know, <laughs> forgive me if I'm. Um, so consciousness through empathy is all about the possibility of choice which leads to the possibility of action. So, you know, conscious through empathy. Empathy allows you to imagine the shape of things. Having imagined the shape of things, you can imagine the possibility of choice. Having imagined the possibility of choice, you can actually choose, which is called an action. Innovation is also about choice. It is not an inevitable force that just has to be let run in any direction. It is not an unconscious self-indulgence, a destructive form of self-indulgence. It can be part of the conscious empathy which builds civilizations, which builds corporations. Successful corporations that run a long time are built to a great extent on the ability of the owners, the inventors, the shareholders to accept that the long term is based on consciousness and a role in society and a certain form of stability. Uh, so one has to say when talking about choice and action that there is, of course, also false choice. And I'll give you an example. When I, you know, we were talking about this beforehand, I had the distinct, the, the greatest thing I ever did in my life was that Morris Strong was the founder, first president, and, uh, and, C, and chair of Petro Canada. And I was the second employee. I was his assistant, child insist assistant. And so uh, by the very act of joining the company, I doubled the size of the National Oil Company, which nobody else was able to do. Um, uh, and, uh, but but what, one of the things that happened was I worked for him in the 70s during the oil crisis. And so I was at meetings that people like me shouldn't be allowed into. And one of the meetings, there was a group called the Workshop for Alternative Energy Strategies, and all the CEOs of the major energy companies around the world and the major users of energy around the world, like the president CEO of General Motors, then the biggest company in the world, took part. And each of them had a bag carrier. I was the bag carrier. And I just remember clearly being in a wonderful hotel in the Four Seasons in uh, Munich uh, at a meeting of the bag handlers. The bag handler of General Motors was the head of research, much senior to me. And everybody with the Europeans were saying to him, saying, well, why don't you guys just you know, move from whatever it was, 15 miles to the gallon to 25 miles to the gallon? It's not difficult. We've done it. You know. And I never forgot. He stood up and said, we don't want to. We don't want to. 
So that's called false choice. That's called self-indulgence. That's called a kind of anger. Those are the people who hated Robert Owen, that thought that the purpose of capitalism was that they could use their power for that, their purposes without any reflection of public purpose. And, you know, if you look today, you see that ExxonMobil, I don't know anybody there anymore, I don't know that world anymore, apparently owns more low carbon patents than any other company or industry in the world. That's very interesting. You want to ask yourself immediately, I certainly do with that, that memory of the General Motors conversation, why do they want to own all those patents? Is it to use them? Or is it to ensure they're not used? Which would be the other possible story. In other words, to prevent innovation in order to maintain a kind of stability which benefits them in a way that doesn't benefit society. So, earlier today, there were a series of very interesting uh, discussions. I think that the message coming out of it all was that the crisis of 2008 is still very much with us. And knowing some of the people who are going to speak over the next couple of days, I don't think there's a lot of disagreement in the room about that, that it was not handled well. Uh, and yet, at the same time, we're in the middle of this astonishing revolution in innovation, technological, communications, all sorts of innovation. And yet, at the same time, the same civilization, particularly in the West, but in other parts of the world, is terrified, absolutely terrified. And, and you know, I'm going back uh, to what Robert Johnson said a bit in, the, in his opening remarks. Terrified of the idea that we could be conscious enough to assume the possibility of choice, which is policy, real choice, real policy of the sort that took place in the early 19th century, in the late 19th century, in the late 1930s, real choice to go in different directions in order to avoid catastrophe. We're terrified of that. We're terrified of changing direction. We're terrified of innovative ideas. I mean, there's endless talk about innovation. No talk, virtually no talk. And I mean, I'm sorry to name you twice, Professor Stiglitz. I mean, there are so few you know, leading economists who stand up and say there are real other possibilities. And I think probably 50% of them in the world are here tonight, you know, uh, who will stand up and say we can actually do this differently. We can actually go in a different direction. There are real choices to uh, be made. And, and, and of course, tied to that idea of choice, of innovative ideas, of changing direction, is the essential element, which is personal responsibility. I've, I, I am struck on a daily basis, at every level, whether it's you know, the intimate details of traveling around the world, or the intimate details of dealing with one's own life, or the big stories. I'm struck again and again and again by the refusal of people in positions of responsibility to act as if they had the power of responsibility, which is the power to provoke public debate in order to allow for interesting directions to be chosen. So why? What is the problem? Why do we have this contradiction? My argument would be very simply that we've slipped, and you, know, uh, you can start timing it from any point you want, but I suppose gradually from the end of the Second World War, because I don't think I should start you in the 12th century, um, in the interests of dinner, uh, uh, we've slipped certainly since the Second World War, into a civilization, certainly in the West, which is a civilization of form over content. Uh, a society dominated increasingly by managers and managerialism. Managers who are not intellectually trained, in general don't read much, uh, don't know much economic history, or political history, or military history, in general, in my experience, um, and who, who have hooked themselves onto innovation, technological innovation, as their saving grace. That they don't have to have ideas, because innovation will look after the direction we go in. And if you actually go back over the discourse that surrounds us on a daily basis, it is about this gigantic class in the public and private sector, which talks in a remarkably passive way about what is possible. They want the power 
But with the power, they say not much can be done. And it comes back again and again and again. They can't do much because innovation is driving us in one direction or another. So in other words, we're smart enough to invent the machines, and then we suddenly become so dumb that we can't give direction to them. I mean, it's a philosophical problem. It's a civilizational problem, this idea that we don't have choices. So that is, I think, coming out of the profound superficiality of the managerial class, uh, frightened that there will be a need to make serious choices. And I have to say that the management schools, and I said this recently at the U of T uh, School of Business, uh, two presidents of, uh, of, of management business schools from across North America and, and Europe. I mean, I think there is a serious, serious problem in our management schools around the world. And they continue to grow because, of course, in a sense, these people have their hands on the money which can fund more and more management schools and give them more and more power in the universities, which are gradually being twisted to serve, in a sense, the theory of managerialism, which is sort of low-level Confucianism, if you know what I mean. I mean, Confucianism at his best is a wonderful, interesting humanist whom Socrates would have been a good friend of, and they would have been equally unemployable and annoying. And um, uh, uh, the Chinese state made a big thing of doing mid-level Confucianism, which is Confucianism as a way of not having debate, but having very high-level managers. And then below that, of course, is low-level managerialism or Confucianism, which I think is, to a great extent, what our societies are in the hand of, hands of. And this makes it very, very difficult to change directions, because there's a horror and a terror of the lack of calm, the lack of continuity. There's a dislike of people who don't conform. There's a, there's a, there's a line and box system for the controlling of power which makes it very difficult to say, well, what direction would, should we go in? I mean, there was an interesting question asked earlier today about uh, guaranteed annual income. I don't know quite what the answer was. I know what I think, which is that in order to save public money, I'm in favor of it. And also to bring a certain level of dignity. It's clear that the managerial approach is to have a multitude of programs which have to be managed and which give them power over individuals, whereas a guaranteed annual income would be very cheap and would remove that power from them. Anyway, uh, that kind of debate is really avoided in our society. The idea of open choice is avoided. And, and so when we talk about 2008 and the failure of the response to 2008, it is a failure of consciousness, a failure of choice, a failure to have the courage to act, to go in different directions, which people in this room suggested and people not in this room suggested. Uh, and who was responsible for that? Well, I think, the, the, if you like, the, 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 you have this vast sort of middle class of the managers, and then you have this sort of the church of the economists, uh, the, man, the, the vast majority of the economists who control the economics departments. And they feed out an ideology which has not changed. They're not teaching anything different since 2008. You have one of the worst failures of any profession, if it's a profession, you know, you know if it's a profession, you have one, an absolutely appalling failure. And no changes are made in what are taught in the universities. And therefore, nothing is changed in what are taught in the management schools. So there's a failure of choice by this sort of unhealthy relationship between management and micro and slightly macro economists who dominate the economics departments, having eliminated in large part the economic historians and the real macro economists. I keep looking over at Professor Stiglitz to see if he's getting up to walk out, but I think he agrees with me, so you know. Um, so if you talk about innovation, I think that it's easier to come at it by beginning in the social domain. And after all, it's, you know, innovation isn't just about machines. I mean, machines are the stuff we invent. So we must be more important than the machines. No? I mean, there's no economy without us. There are no machines without us. So surely innovation is about us, not about the machines. So social innovation is the fascinating thing. And it's the thing that 
in terms of the creative sides of social innovation, we've had a lot of trouble in the last 40 years. It's been more and more difficult to talk about choice. But let me um, just take a local example. I think about 20% of you are from Toronto and Southern Ontario, so they'll understand, and others may or may not. It's interesting, this city, I mean, apart from the mayor, uh, it, it is interesting, you know, uh, really it is, uh, and hopefully it'll be gone soon. Um, the majority of the citizens in this city and the surrounding suburbs, so it's somewhere around between six and eight million if you put it all together. The majority of the citizens in this conglomeration, agglomeration, were born outside of Canada, uh, all over the world. And we have a... Uh, immigration citizenship policy, which means that uh, becoming an immigrant to Canada is exactly like getting engaged. And within four to five years, you get married. It's a little bit of a long engagement for two people, but for a country, it's very fast. And 85% of the immigrants to Canada become citizens within five years. The United States is 40%, and Europe's having a heart attack over 7% or something like that. You know, sorry, I'm just be very straightforward about these things. Um, now, immigration is one of the, I would say, in the top ten of the noble words of this civilization. Number one, which is a possibility to say it's the number one word. It is an incredibly noble term. And uh, not migrant, not migration. It's one of the things that some of our academics are slipping on because they go to international conferences and hear Europeans talking about migrants. Migrant meaning you've come here, now will you leave? You know, or as immigrant means, you've come here, why aren't you a citizen yet? We want you involved. We want you carrying the burden of citizenship along with us. Uh, so what's interesting about immigrants, really interesting about immigrants, is that, of course, they've had to make an incredibly tough choice. It doesn't matter whether they're a professor with a PhD coming to a good job or a vice president of a corporation or coming from a war-torn, disastrous country. They've all had to choose to leave their countries in order to make a new life in another place. That shows a level of courage and a level of consciousness and an ability to choose which is really remarkable. So when people are always saying, well, what does Canada get out of the immigrants? And they always try to come up with numbers. Forget the numbers. What we get out of it is this remarkable infusion of people who actually have proved they're courageous, conscious, and know how to make choices. This is really something astonishing. And I've noticed over the last few years, I haven't really seen numbers on it, but I've noticed quite regularly, um, that we're seeing a growing really quite fast, business sector, small and medium-sized owned corporations, owned by family and friends, run and owned entirely by new Canadians. So they've come with this energy, and they've turned this energy, in this case, into a really important and growingly important part of the business community. And then you look around in the big corporations, and people in this room know it, you see Immigrants, new Canadians rising to the top everywhere. Why are they rising to the top? Well, because the people who were born here didn't have to work as hard and don't know as much how hard you have to work. And the result is they're doing very, very well, thank you very much. And they're carrying far more than their weight, which is a wonderful thing uh, for us. So what have I just described to you? I've described to you innovation. I've described to you a social model, which is an incredibly cutting edge and innovative social model. I've described a city, this city, which is probably the most cutting-edge city in the world in terms of the way people live together. And those of you who have spent time here, you see it, you sort of think, what's going on here? How does this work? We don't even know how it works because the leadership is what it is. But it just works on its own because people made a decision that they wanted it to work, that it was interesting to not use the Westphalian, monolithic, Euro-American model, melting pot model of the nation state. Instead of that, to have this sort of mess of people who enjoy being together and have, think it's fun to live in complexity. Now, that's a very interesting step into thinking about how to deal with machines, you know, how to deal with running countries. And let me add a second local story, which is 
which is uh, the following. In 2003, in August, there was a terrible heat wave in Europe. Many of you will remember this. Um, I've seen different numbers. Uh, there are reputable numbers as high as 70,000 Europeans dying from heat frustration. I don't use that number, but I've seen it quite regularly. But there are very specific numbers. For, for example, France, which is very good on statistics, says that 14,802 French citizens died of heat frustration during that summer in the month of August. Um, I think in Holland it was 1,500. In Portugal it was 2,000. Why did they die? They died because these are countries which are reliant upon the old modern model. The old modern model of social organization, which is about technological organization, managerial uh, coordination, experts, and a sort of tribal assumption that we're a country so it'll be OK, because we're all in it together. We don't have to do anything about it, but we're all in it together. And the result was they woke up in the beginning of September and found that 14,000 had died, or 2,000 had died, or 1,500 had died. It's very interesting. I spent a lot of time in Europe. It was a very interesting failure, and in many ways, one could say the ultimate failure of the Westphalian nation state. So a few months ago in Toronto, we had an ice storm, which was very interesting. And it shut down uh, a third of the city. So somewhere between a million and three, two and a half million Torontonians were without heat or electricity for up to 10 days in weather of minus 10 to minus 30. Now, hypothermia kills you as fast as heat prostration. In fact, hypothermia kills you faster than heat prostration. Not one person died. It, Canadians here know I very rarely make what you might call patriotic speeches. It's not my line. So don't take this as a patriotic speech. It's not. But nobody died. And why did nobody die? Because there was an atmosphere in the city which was the result of social innovation. I remember the first day the, light, the, lights, the, the, the lights went out, etc. Um, I turned on the radio and people were saying, now, the lights are out and the heat's out. You better go and check and see if there are any old people who live anywhere around you and make sure they're OK. And people were competing to invite people to come and stay with them. It was a moment of enormous triumph in the middle of our humiliation about our leadership. It was a moment of incredible triumph for this model of social innovation. And interesting enough, not many people go around and say that. I don't quite know why. Because it was an incredibly interesting moment. A friend of mine, a woman, had, uh, had uh, twins not long before. And she said, the phone never stopped ringing. People saying, why aren't you coming to stay with us? I want to see your twins. You know? And so there's a very interesting idea of how you can make societies different by taking a conscious purpose approach as opposed to an unconscious purpose approach. The point I'm making is that there are always choices. The second wave of slavery in the United States and elsewhere came as a direct outcome of technological innovation. Whitney's uh, cotton ginny in the States, and of course, incredible changes in spinning, weaving, and steam power in England. So that you, could sudden, you suddenly could pick uh, cotton a lot faster, provided you had a lot more slaves, if that was your option. Right? You believed that you didn't have a choice. You had to have more slaves. And the British, in particular, uh, said, we need more cheap cotton, raw cotton. So the British were making a fortune out of the slave trade. Right? And everybody acted as if they didn't have a choice, that the market had determined that the only way to do this was to have more slaves and to put up with slavery. I'll give you a last example, IBM. Some of you will know this, some of you won't. It's a very difficult topic. The Holroyd counting machine, which is, I guess, the forerunner of the computers, um, in the 1930s played an astonishing role in the organization and carrying out of efficient factory production, and also office management and so on, uh, sort of the, putting the cards in, taking the cards out, organizing numbers and so on. There's a very good book, long book written about this, IBM and the Holocaust. In the 1930s and 40s, the Holroyd counting machine, with the cooperation of IBM, was absolutely key and central to the organization of the gathering up of the Jews, because it was a very difficult thing to do. It would have taken months and months and months before the Holroyd counting machine, because how could you do it? How could you figure out where they were? How could you keep track? How could you send people out to do it? It was done overnight. 
And nobody says, well, how was it done overnight? It was done overnight because it was organized. It was organized by new technology, thanks to the cooperation of IBM and the Horoith counting machine. And those, then those machines were moved into the death camps, and the death camps, the major death camps, all had an IBM Holroyd counting machine in order to run the system efficiently. And then as soon as the war started ending, the armies went through the camps, gathered up those machines and gave them back to IBM, and they went back to running factories or doing health care or whatever. The point of the story, which is an incredibly horrible story, is that technology is just machinery. And if you don't make choices and shape it, it can be used for any purposes whatsoever at all. So technology should not be about the fear of doubt. It should be about comfort with doubt. Why doubt? Because it's doubting that allows us consciously to decide that we're going to act differently, that we're going to make different kinds of decisions, that we're able to live with uncertainty as a form of stability. So I would think, I'm guessing, and no, none of us know, as was said earlier today, we probably got another 30 to 50 years of total instability in terms of the uh, technological revolution in terms of communication. At some point, it'll plateau and we'll get somewhere and everybody will agree that this is where we're going to be for a while. But it's going to go on, I would think, in a revolutionary manner for quite some time. So it's incredibly important that if we want to live in civilizations, in democracies, in places where people are not doing too badly, all people are doing not too badly, it is incredibly important that we decide that we can live with the instability of, the, of this constant change because we're capable of making choices about the shapes of policy, social policy, and how the machines can be used. So I'm being very specific here. We've had 40 years approximately of deregulation tied to technical innovation, tied to managerial increasing domination, tied to the marginalization and the demotion of democratic politics, either through corruption or whatever. And at the end of the 40 years, we're in an era of rising populism, which is what Mussolini rose to power on, racism, which started coming back in almost exactly at the beginning of this century, became fashionable to be a racist for certain people, and you could get away with it in public. Corruption at very deep levels in the public and private sector. A, a terrible sense of insecurity. Rising state violence around the world. Food banks brought in in the 70s as a six-month temporary phenomenon becoming a normal phenomenon as if we were in Britain in the middle of the 19th century. And shelters. Shelters in which you will find, because I've been in many, many shelters, in which you will find increasingly young men who have full-time jobs and are paid so little that they can't afford to rent one room. So that tells you that we're not making choices about what to do about jobs and innovation. It's not about a job, we lost a job here, a job's popped up over there. That is not a civilizational model. The model is we can't have people living in those conditions, whether you're on the right or the left. So, this kind of situation is the exact opposite of what innovation is meant to be. It's a suggestion of passivity, not simply in government and politics, but passivity in our civilization. And you know, we saw in 2008, after years of a kind of financial innovation, um, that there was a disaster. And I think one of the interesting, you'll forgive me for these phrases, but it's very important to say things sometimes that are really clear. For the first time in the history of democracy, probably, I have to be careful about that, I'd say probably to cover myself, a demo democratically elected states around the world chose to save the banks and not the people. It was a very clear choice that was made and an appalling choice, which did not work out. Now, I'm going to say something here, which you know, some people think I'm a philosopher, some people think I'm an economist, now I'll prove I'm a philosopher. Um, uh, that was a joke. Uh, uh, instead of giving the money to the banks, all they had to do was take about a third of that amount of money and say in the United States, we'll pay off, the government says, tomorrow morning, every mortgage up to $300,000, or in Europe, every mortgage up to 300,000 euros is paid off. There are two options, paid off or canceled, or a mixture of the two. So let's say paid off. 
tomorrow morning, if you have a $400,000 mortgage, you still owe $100,000. But they're all paid off tomorrow morning, and then we'll work out the details. What have you just done? You've saved, in many cases, a new property owning class. You've stabilized the working class, the lower middle class, and a good part of the middle class. You've got them out of the basis of the crisis. In the process, you have taken them out of debt. Their money, of course, goes to the banks. You just saved the banks that are capable of being saved. And the ones that can't be saved by that shouldn't be saved. There are far too many of them, and we should get rid of them. You know, there's no need to keep all those banks. If they need to go, let them go. Uh, and then, because they're out of debt and they've given the money to the banks, th those citizens are now in a position to borrow again. So I'm not saying that we wouldn't be in this crisis, but that simple act would have put us in a completely different position to the position we're in today. And I look at Spain where 500 people a day are being thrown out of their uh, apartments and houses because of mortgage problems, where you have a 50 to 55% youth unemployment. And the figures are not lower than that in reality. They're higher than that in reality when you start analyzing what those figures are made up of. And so not only did we choose the banks, because after all, we the citizens have not thrown most of these governments out, choose the banks over the people, but we accepted this sort of myth that debt was a moral evil. You know, when did the worst of Christianity get control of governments and economics departments? That morality was stuck on top of concepts of debt. It's an astonishing idea. And as a result, it is not surprising that most of the governments followed austerity policies, which are policies of the worst of Christianity, which is sort of the hair shirt, flagellation, you have sinned policy, and if we whip you enough, you will become a better person and not sin so much. And I think all the economists in the room will agree with me. There is no example in history of sustained austerity being used in a situation of collapse to produce recovery. I think I read you right on this. Uh, I mean, I don't think there's any example of this. So let me just finish by, by uh, saying this. What does consciousness look like? What does choice look like? Well, I mean, for me, it's pretty simple. I mean, there, uh, there are a whole bunch of things you can do, and they're perfectly doable. One of them is that our education systems in the West, particularly in North America, uh, have moved increasingly over the last 50 years towards a utilitarian model. It's one of the things that's come out of all the other things I've been describing. And that rise of utilitarianism in the public school, in the private schools, in the universities, is exactly like using austerity in a crisis. It's taking, in a time of insecurity, and a time of innovation, both technological and social, good and bad, instead of educating people to feel confident about insecurity, confident about choice, confident about the fact that they might have to have five jobs in their life and it's not a big deal because they have the ideas in their mind, the capacity to think in their mind. Instead of doing that, instead of strengthening citizens, we weaken them by saying, we've got to train these, to forget about educating them, we've got to train these people so they can get a job. Of course, the jobs we're training them for are obsolete before they graduate. And then we have this horrible thing of retraining and retraining and retraining, always for jobs which are either about to be obsolete or, uh, uh, or already obsolete. Uh, so I think there's an enormous need, and this can be done by citizens, it can be done by economists, it can be done by leaders, rooms like this, to create an atmosphere for a reform, a serious reform of our education systems at all levels, which move us towards the thinking model and away from the utilitarian model. That carries with it the essential need to demote the importance of management schools, particularly in the West. I would suggest closing them all, but I know that's probably not doable. I've said it in almost every one that they'll let me in the doors of. But let, wouldn't it be neat to just close half of them and see what happens? And I think there's room for a radical fight to take place on university boards of trustees and directors to say, are we taking the universities in the right direction? We are being driven in this direction by money which is essentially coming out of the managerial world. And it has a model which is not taking us anywhere. That's why I gave you that list of racism and populism and all the rest of it. It isn't taking us anywhere which is working for us. So normally in a corporation, you would say, this has failed. Let's do something else. 
let's make a different choice. And instead of that, we're just pushing further and further down this road of, frankly, mediocrity. Um, I think that then brings you to the departments of economics. There are some very good survivors in the departments of economics. I think they're a tiny minority. And I think it's time to do what, I don't know, the young professors with their, did with their students in what century was it in, in, in Paris, which is to walk away from the university that was controlled by the church, because it is a church today, uh, and walk off the island and set up a new university. I would suggest that rather than try to reform the departments of economics, people like you should really be talking to each other about demanding the creation of parallel departments of economics in the universities in order to ensure that there really is our places in the university that are thinking differently about economics, not from a fighting back uh, position. And the fact that the departments did not reform themselves after 2008 means they are not capable of reforming themselves. What do they require from us? A civil war? A global civil war? Complete collapse before they'll change their course books? I mean, it's not possible, it's not acceptable, and I don't think it can go on this way. Transparency. One of the things that came with the rise of managerialism and new technology was a fashion for secrecy. Uh, it started out of the Second World War for obvious reasons. People kept their jobs, so to speak, in the secrecy area. They got a new enemy on both sides so that they could justify it. And it grew and grew and grew. And the, the communications technology and the information technology were used, if you, say, if you like, to give importance to doing away with democratic tra transparency and increasing uh, secrecy. And, um, so it's tied intimately to the idea of power in a management-driven society. Bin Laden understood this perfectly. I don't think he intellectually understood it. He instinctively understood it. He understood where our most, our weakest spot was. That's what a terrorist does. They, f they pick your weakest spot. And he knew that there was a force at work, which was this for the security world the desire for secrecy in the managerial world, which could be released in some way. I'm not saying he's new consciously, but he understood that if he did something really awful, really, really unacceptable, and really tragic, and really awful, that we would do exactly the wrong thing in response, which is precisely what we have done, which is we unleashed our security forces and fell madly in love with secrecy. And anything which is secret is somehow allowed and allowable in the name of terrorism, fighting terrorism, or whatever. And I'm just going to give you, you notice there hasn't been, there have only been one statistic so far. Here's the second. Um, when I wrote Voltaire's Bastards, I used 1989 statistics, and I have this chapter on secrecy, and I made this enormous joke about the preposterous fact that secrets, State secrets were at such a high level. And private sector is just as bad, but no country is better than any other on this. The only country which is honest about this is the United States, because they have people who actually keep statistics, and they're independent enough that they announce the numbers. Canada isn't France, England, Germany. We hide all this stuff. So the United States announced in 1989 that they had created 6,796,501 new secrets. And of course, it's a joke. I mean, we could go out and build a nuclear bomb. What are these secrets? They're not secrets. They're people in offices taking power for themselves, thereby preventing things from happening. You remember I said, talked about boxes and lines? You, you get a hold of some information, you close the door, and you keep it in your room, thereby preventing government from working or preventing large corporations from working. So it was just a total joke. Well, I can tell you that in 2009, the United States government created 54,651,765 new secrets. I mean, Alice in Wonderland has nothing on this. This is delusional, completely delusional. And as I say, Canada is just as bad, England is just as bad. England might even be slightly worse, because they really like to pretend that, you know, James Bond and all that stuff. Um, so what that tells you is this is a misuse of innovation, a total misuse of it. And we have allowed it to happen because we don't believe we have the choice to say that transparency is the real defense of democracy and capitalism not obscurantism. 
so it's a perfect illustration of the problem of the relationship between technology and management. And the leaks, which are so horrifying to these people, are the, simply the natural outcome of having a million something people have access to secrets. I mean, if you go up to those numbers, you can't keep the secrets, and you don't, and you shouldn't, frankly. Um, and besides, they're not secrets, they're self indulgent, uh, power collecting uh, bits, and bits of paper or emails. So all of this is tied to, and this is where I'll end, is tied to a very bizarre conviction. And that conviction is that, and particularly in the area of communications, I mean, I have my BlackBerry in here and all the rest of it, so I'm on side, and, you know, but, but there is a conviction that, that what this communications revolution has done, and indeed production revolution has done, you know, in Chinese factories, is that we can do more and more faster and faster. And that therefore speed, is a fundamental characteristic of capitalism, of democracy, of civilization. It's completely untrue. Nowhere in philosophy of any sort does it say that a central characteristic of humanity in any interesting form, and certainly in any civilizational form, is speed. Speed can be useful from time to time. You know, if you're about to attack an enemy, you need a little secret for a couple of weeks, and then you have to move fast. And then it's over, hopefully. But the idea that you build a civilization on speed is a deeply, deeply flawed idea and a deep misunderstanding of the purpose of innovation. Of course, it's good to be able to do things at a certain speed, but that is not actually the meaning of it. The meaning of it is not the speed because that causes you, if you think that, to lose the importance of the complexity of change. That's what 2008 is about, about misunderstanding the meaning of the complexity of speed and change. And the result is what you know. So if you believe that innovation is about speed, you've put yourself in that thing I described at the beginning, which is the passive position of believing that you don't have choices, that you cannot give direction to innovation in an era of technological change. But the fact is, you know, that when you look at these civilizations, you ask yourself, why is populism coming back? Sounds pretty old fashioned. Why is racism coming back? And you go down the list of old nationalism. What are, where did these things all come from? They come as a reaction to the misapplication of the idea that we don't have choices and that things are too fast for us to make choices. And I just, if you'll forgive me for ending as the president of Penn, uh, I deal with this on a daily basis. We have 148 Penn centers in 104 countries. I've just come from Burma and Thailand. One may be coming up, maybe not, the other going down. And violence in both places. We have 850 writers in prison today around the world. So it's funny, for a world where technology innovation is supposed to be running everything, and self-interest is supposed to be driving everything, and people don't read anymore, and what matters is power and self-interest, why are there 850 writers in prison around the world today? And about eight years ago, 10 years ago, governments started not bothering to beat writers up or to torture them or to put them in prison. They just killed them. You know, They just cut their heads off and put them on poles and say, don't do any more blogging and things like that. So there are about 50 writers killed a year around the world. It's quite a few. You know, it certainly discourages people, right? That's pretty old-fashioned. That's a pretty old-fashioned response of power to new technology. So you have to think about what does that mean? And I must add, having said there are 850 writers in jail, as far as I know, there are no economists in jail, <laughs> in spite of 2008, you know? There are a couple of generals, five, six, hardly any bankers, certainly not in the West, a few businessmen mainly in autocratic countries, maybe five or six presidents and prime ministers, 850 writers. So what that tells you is that this very simple mechanism, which we're doing tonight, which is freedom of expression, is as powerful as it always was. It's lovely to have the microphone. It's nice to know it's being recorded. I told them to turn the film of me off because I wanted you looking at me and not at the film, you know, the video that was over there. But, you know, it's, it is amazing to see the extent to which freedom of expression still terrifies power. How much money is spent to make oil sound clean? 
how much money is spent to have people combing through emails in China. I mean, I can almost send an email on China and, uh, to somebody else and get a response back indirectly from the people who've been listening within a week. It's really quite funny. You, know, you just send this thing saying you're going to do something, and they don't want it, so they send you an email within about a week. Um, so th this tells you that, that, that technological innovation is wonderful, but choice, consciousness, and power of the citizen, of you, uh, choices put together by economists and business people and citizens through their elected representative are still central to the possibility of ideas and relationships between citizens and the simple reality that speed is not a characteristic of civilization. We don't think any faster than Dante, but we can think quite a bit and we can make choices. Thank you very much. Is that all right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't have any questions. I think. <laughs> but thank I have you, answers. <laughs> um, as an economist, manager, and social innovator, I, I, I thought I'd to Toronto, um, which I consciously chose. Um, no, really, you, you've given Tour de Force um, uh, meaning. And I, I really want to take comment or questions from the floor. We have about 15 minutes, no more. But let me just start the conversation with one question about the diminution of choice which is uh, somewhere along the way, uh, and it might have to do with the rise of the managerial culture, our sense of what governments should be doing for us uh, and to us seems to have changed. Uh, and I'm not getting quite when or how this began, and why is it that we see government in the same managerial terms that we see much more um, narrow and private enterprises. I mean, what, what would you? Well, I think, there's, I think there's two parts to it. One is that actually the management schools are very similar. And Vultures Bastards, and Raptor was 93. Mm. There's a whole chapter comparing the Harvard Business School with Lena in Paris. I mean, theoretically, one is, is, is uh, training people to run government, and the other is training business people. But the methodology is identical. It's basically methodology set up first by the Inquisition and then by uh, the Jesuits and, and then by the armies in the late 19th century. And it's not particularly interesting stuff. Um, but they're very similar methods. And I think the second thing is that, uh, and here the economists would have many opinions on this, I think that one of the you know, economic theories have a time in power usually somewhere between 30 and 60 years. And then they run out of steam. And they're not, not because they're wrong, they run out of steam. You're three or four or five generations into the theory. So the people who are you know, running Keynesianism in the 1960s and 70s don't actually know what it's like to fight for it anymore. They're, they're, they're slightly degenerate, rather the way the business school people and, and, and the neoconservatives are very degenerate today. Because they, they they're three or four generations into doing this. Um, so I think what happened in the 70s was that this theory that everything was about self-interest and everything could go on a kind of business model got a run. And of course, basic questions were not asked. Uh, the other day I was talking to a young woman who's doing a PhD here, here on, in healthcare and she kept talking about the healthcare industry. And I said, why are you using the word industry? And she said, well, I don't know. That's what we're told to use is the word industry. Well, but why are you using the word industry? Industry means you want to make a profit. Are you saying you're against single-tier public health care in Canada? And she said, no, no, I'm in favor of it. I said, well, why are you calling it an industry then? What do you call the, what do you call the patients? Do you call them clients? Yes. Are they coming to buy shoes? I mean, language actually means something. So you got into this situation where words and phrases and paragraphs were being used, which were theoretically about efficiency and delivery. And they actually didn't apply to what you were trying to do. Even if there were flaws in the earlier system, this was not the answer to it. To pretend you were, to pretend, well, sorry, the, there, uh, where's the nice lady I was having dinner with? 
well, she's not here at the moment, but she was saying that um, uh, uh, why, why uh, corporations are allowed to treat investment in innovation as the sort of, what do you call it, a, a, a capital, uh, a cost. Write down. Write down. Whereas we've just gone through 40 years of this group of economists convincing us that if governments spend money on investment, it's the same thing as just spending money. That it isn't actually capital investment. And that's part of you know, the hate the debt school, is that there is no such thing as allowable government capital investment. OK. Um, if you raise your hands, then we can acknowledge you. Are there mics? Go ahead, please. Ramo Genchai from Simon Fraser University. From which, sorry? Uh, Simon Fraser. Oh, great. Yeah. Vancouver. Um, my, I really appreciated um, the talk, the, li the, the line of thought process. Um, very grateful for the organizers to put all this together. My line of thought is that the evolution, as some of the speakers alluded earlier on, is such a long memory process. It takes a long time to see changes, tangible changes in human lifetime. Sometimes even may take hundreds of years to cheat to see a possible change. But the type of changes that we are seeing in our lifetime in the last 30, 40 years is much more rapid. The rate of change is a lot faster than the rate of change that we see in the rate of change that we see in devolution. So if there is such a discrepancy, what should the average crowd elude such a discrepancy to? Um, how, how do you evaluate such difference? Well, I would just say that <clears throat> I'm not entirely in, in agreement in the sense that I actually think that many of the changes in the past have been just as fast. I mean, the Industrial Revolution, I mean, hit England, Britain, I mean, agreed it was one country, but with an incredible rapidity. It was boom. And suddenly, you know, suddenly there were these meetings between the owners and the, the, the weavers and the, the artisan class, and they just said, you're out. It's over. You know, overnight, they were out. It, it happened very, very fast. And, you know, you, you, you know uh, I, I think, you know, the, the arrival of certain kinds of uh, transport, uh, it, it's always been quite fast. I think, I'll tell you what I, I think is an important thing to focus on is this. According to the international reinsurance industry, they did these numbers for me because I agreed to give a speech and I said, you have to do these numbers for me. And our, uh, I, wanted, I wanted life expectancy numbers. And they told me that life expectancy in the West, so it's already vague, in 1900 was 50. So Taylorism and Fordism, if you use that term, uh, were put in place in a society where people died on average at 50, which you, know, you have to average it all out. So when you started talking about retirement, basically the idea was, can we keep them working until they die? Or do we get them out of here and they die two years later, sort of thing, on average? Uh, life expectancy in the Roman Empire, I didn't do the numbers, but apparently they're good. Uh, uh, in, in a sort of height of the Roman, of the second half of the Roman Empire, I believe, was 28. And if you were a gladiator, it was 29. Because gladiators were the sports stars of the day. They didn't actually die a lot. They were very valuable property. Uh, and they had to be looked after. Um, so it took them you know, from 200 AD or 100 AD to 1900 to get from 28 to 50. And it took us from 1900 to 2000 to get to, in the West, to about 80 from 50. 
And if you're born today, if you're born in 2000, probably your life expectancy is 100. So the single most important fast revolution in the West is actually not technolo communications technology or the nuclear bomb or the computer. It's the virtual doubling of life expectancy in one century. And, and we have done nothing about it, which is to say, we have not, this is part of our inability to think and choose and decide. We haven't changed our education system. We haven't changed, on, in a purposeful manner, our health system. Uh, we haven't changed our education. We haven't changed anything, employment system, to, to deal with the fact that we've doubled life expectancy. We're still telling kids to graduate and get to university and graduate and get a job and then retire. And then what are they supposed to do for the next 50 years? We actually haven't thought any of this through. This is a really important social innovation question. We're not dealing with it because we're so terrified by the idea of changing direction. Catherine. Yeah. And we'll take one more and then mm, Thank whatever. You. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, I'm John. Seated. I'm fine. Now. My name is uh, Catherine Fife. I'm a new politician in the province of Ontario, so I'm still a little hopeful for change. Um, I was really intrigued by your, uh, your ideas around who controls patents and who controls intellectual property. And I wanted to uh, get your opinion on how we can ensure that innovation continues and prospers. That, that what? Innovation continues and prospers uh, and the role of government perhaps in that. Um, because I think that government should have a role in protecting ideas because that's a natural resource that we have in this province and in this country. I mean, I think Jim said very wise things about this at the beginning of the day, and you know, and talked about how Canada was really behind in this area. And frankly, this is not my area. Even though in Penn, we actually are very concerned not by the self-interested side of, of of copyright, because obviously writers make their money out of copyright in a sense. But we're actually concerned because copyright is slipping into another domain which relates, if it's misused, relates to freedom of expression. Um, but I'm not at all an expert in this area, and there are other people in the room who I think could give you a, a far better answer than I could. Except government has a very important role to play. And lawyers. And there are some really interesting lawyers in this area. You have to find the ones who actually believe in it, that there are ways through. It doesn't have to all dissolve in the sand just because people can download things. I mean, I, the one thing I would say is this, th that, you know, I was talking about speed. Uh, this sort of idea that everything's happening everywhere. We can't control anything. It's simply not true. I mean, there was an argument about 12, 15 years ago, which was that we couldn't possibly regulate the stock markets because they were going so fast. And as soon as New York shut down, whatever opened up, and they were going 24 hours a day, and we couldn't regulate it. And then, you know, the, the international bankers, the state bankers, started thinking about this. We had a couple of crises, and people realized it was the precise opposite. That in the old days, you had these young men, gonadally driven men, you know, jumping up and down on the floor, screaming and writing on little pieces of paper, and then crumpling them up and throwing them on the floor. And how are you going to how are you going to regulate that, right? Whereas now, it's all recorded. And it's all integrated all around the world because it's international. For the first time in history, governments can effectively regulate the stock market. It's the exact opposite of what we were told. So right now, we're in a kind of pessimistic period over, over patents and so on. I think that the same will probably turn out to be true. We just have to have the energy and the belief that things can be done and enforced. Let's take one last comment to our left. Uh, yes, um, I've uh, found this uh, end of day uh, presentation uh, extremely stimulating. And I've noticed, uh, I've made notes, uh, you said, for the first time in democracy, elected people chose to save banks instead of the people. Sorry, I didn't understand that. Yeah, I, I'm just quoting you back that you said, for the first time in democracy, people elected people to choose to save the banks instead of the people. That's something that I thought you said. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah. And um, you also talked about uh, that 
people might have to uh, form a revolution of some kind. So in the alternative of that happening, I wonder if you might just say a few words on what the alternative might be to a revolution. And you, that you might pick on an approach that people might take in the choices that they can make in the institutions that are there, such as legal, such as education, such as government, um, and whatever. Would you please comment on that? Yeah, well, look, I think that, I think what happens if the elite structures do not do their job, which I guess is what I was talking about, is something happens. Eventually something happens. We've had a lot of warnings. Frankly, we've had more warnings than most civilizations get. You look at the last 15 years, you look at the warnings we've had, that it's not working, that populations are not happy, they are not satisfied, they've tried everything under the sun from not voting to voting for impossible people, anything to try and shock the elites into doing something. Then we've got these, these sort of the Occupy movements, the um, uh, Idle No More movement. Uh, these are very interesting, not because they're going to take power, they're interesting because they're not structured. They're not unions going into the streets or political parties going into the streets. They're actually almost spontaneous, almost spontaneous. That's a sign. If you know your history, those are indications that something is happening, that the people are not happy, that there is a real problem. And frankly, this turning one's back on all of this is incredibly dangerous and incredibly irresponsible if you actually believe in the continuation of democracy. So, um, you know, I talked about the possibility of taking decisions. I mean, that's what the whole speech was about. Look, right now Canada is, is, is completing a trade deal with Honduras. I have no opinions on the trade deal with Honduras, except that we just finished doing a big study on violence and human rights and freedom of expression in Honduras. And Honduras is the single most dangerous place to use freedom of expression in the world. People are being killed daily on a regular basis for saying things, for writing things. So people like us, Pan, etc., we've just today, actually, I, I would be there if I weren't here, testified at a parliamentary committee, the trade committee, asking them to include in the trade agreement a conditionality, is the phrase they use, what I would call a condition uh, in English, uh, as opposed to whatever that other language is, a condition, a condition which is to do with freedom of expression and human rights. This is now done more and more. Let's just do it. You know, that's a choice. Let's just do it. Let's do the trade deal with the condition in it and be part of that movement. Um, uh, you know, I was in a debate uh, a couple of months ago in Germany with a guy called Lars Feld. Do some of you know him? A German economist who's a key advisor to the chancellor. And he came in with a wonderful, you know, bunch of charts that are actually unanswerable that proved that everything was fine and standards of living were going up and all the rest of it. And he just sat there and he got to the last one. It was one of those, you know, all the points. And he said, this proves that uh, the conditions of employment have not gone down in the period of deregulation. And everybody just started laughing. It's very important to express humor when faced by things which are clearly untrue, to actually realize that these are not proofs. Um, the other day I was in a private conversation with a governor of a national bank. I will not name, many of you know this person. Um, and so we were talking about these problems and eventually he said, it was a he, said, oh well, it's all cyclical. Yeah. Yeah. Can you think of a more appalling uh, abdication of responsibility. So I, for once in my life, I actually had the phrase at the right moment. And I said, you're absolutely right. It's, you know, 55% unemployed youth in Spain, blah, blah, blah. It's all conditioned. You're right, it's all cyclical, just like the Second World War. And he looked at me and walked away. Um, you know, so that sort of idea that it's cyclical, that, uh, you know, that you can do trade deals, that trade will produce freedom of expression. There's no historic proof of that. Whereas there is historic proof that if you pass laws and, in, and enforce them about freedom of expression, it will increase and strengthen the economy. Um, uh, I think it, it, the last comment I would make is this. You know, one of the outcomes of the 70s was a belief that because we'd gone global, 
Therefore, national politics were no longer of enormous importance. The size of political parties started collapsing. Generation after generation stopped thinking that politics was the most important thing, and you saw the rise of the NGOs. You know, in the 70s, there were a couple of NGOs. We invented, Penn invented a couple of NGOs, and you now have millions of NGOs with literally hundreds of millions of people between the ages of 15 and 50 in NGOs, right? I'm not saying they're bad. I'm not saying they're good. What they are is a parallel lobby structure without power. Sometimes they can pull some things off. Great. I'm, you know, I'm part of that. But, but what is that lobbying for good, if that's what it is? What is that compared to being an elected member of the legislature of Ontario? Are you still there? Yes. And what is it? Because people say, oh, well, I don't want to be a backbencher. I want to, I'll only go in, I'm important. I'll only go in if I'm a cabinet minister. Really? I mean, talk about egomania. And it's a total misunderstanding of the role of the backbencher. The backbencher in Ottawa and in Ontario has a lot of power. If I, if I have a problem in my riding, I call up my MP. And my MP, whatever their party, is dying to make people suffer. They're dying to give a hard time to deputy ministers and to cabinet ministers, and they really do something. You can get things done. So I guess what I'm saying is we need a radical, massive return of young people into organized, mainstream democratic politics. We need this. I don't care what party it is. People have to be going in in groups, and they mustn't be saying, I will do this, and I will. You know, most important level of politics, elected politics in Canada is school boards. That's where we decide what our country's gonna look like because this country is run by the public school educated people. And how many people vote in school board elections? What percentage? 25%. Because we all wanna be involved in nuclear policy. We don't vote in school boards. I mean, give me a break. I mean, you know, we need to be getting, encouraging, pushing, younger people to ruin their lives by going into politics. Ruin their marriages, make their children hate them. Go into politics, show that democracy works and has power. And I think you would find, if you saw that happening, you'd suddenly find a return of confidence in the democratic process. And people would start saying, yeah, actually what happens on the floor of the House of Commons really matters. Each debate really matters. You can't do gigantic omnibus bills because we want to debate each bill, not because we're going to defeat the government through the debate, but because the words of that debate will spread in the way that words do into the population through the media, through word of mouth. It's amazing how it spreads. And people start talking about it and it becomes an issue. That's the purpose of the debate in the House of Com Commons or the Congress or the Assemblée Nationale or whatever, is that words come out Arguments happen. Time is wasted through debate. The most glorious characteristic of democracy is the wasting of time through freedom of expression. That's how we figure out what to do. That's how we get control of the direction of the country. That's what needs to happen. So. Great. Thank you. Thank you, John, for um, really putting a cap on not just the day, but the kinds of things that motivate us to be here today and, and that led in so many ways to the creation of CG 12 years ago, INET four years ago, uh, and reminding us about the power of, not just the power of ideas, but the fact that we shape them and that we shape our own destiny. And can I add, break in? One thing is I was allowed to read an early draft of something which I think INET's gonna produce later, so I'm not gonna say what it is, but I think they're working out, or is it, it's INET, isn't it? Yes. They're, they're working out a way of putting forward a policy idea which is really about ideas. And I was quite impressed by it. I think it's a very interesting thing, that, um, and I really wish you well with it. Well, thank you. And on that note, thank you all. And see you bright and